With Mother Love Bone, you had some success and a bit of a tragedy there. What made you decide to form something totally different? We wanted to do something new. I got a call to try singing, so I sent up a tape. I called Stone up and said, you got to come over right now and you got to listen to this. All of a sudden, I was living in Seattle. I remember when Ed first came to town, it seemed like it was something that he'd been kind of waiting for his whole life. It was obvious within the first few minutes that it was something that I'd been waiting for also. I'll be a new kid for a while. The music that sprouted right off the bat was heartfelt and deep, and before we knew it, we all spent five days rehearsing. The sixth day, we, we played a fucking show. It was all a whirlwind. We went from bands to playing little clubs to a little bit bigger clubs, and then we get in Lollapalooza, and then you have everything blow up. It's a little bit overwhelming to see this many people. kind of got ripped off of that slow rise that R.E.M. got. Wow, we've been swallowed up by the mainstream. No one's going to want to listen to us. We were just trying to figure out how we were going to be a band down the road. How were you going to survive and not piss someone off? I think a lot of the energy became a part of us, and whether it's anger or intensity or whatever that is, I think that ended up being a part of the songs. You have to be very committed to your ideals because you are risking turning some people off. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not allowed to speak up on the issue. I feel proud of the fact that we're known as a live band before anything else these days. Yeah, it's just such a great gauge on how the crowd's feeling, and that's why the set list doesn't get done until 10 minutes before we play. You're the whole reason that this thing is even halfway a success. I seem to recognize your face. People stayed with us because we stayed true to whatever our vision was. By engaging with the fans and then playing songs that are important to them, the energy you get back, that's where the shows become magical. I hear you. You feel lucky every time you go on tour and you go like, wow, man, like 15,000 people showed up and that just kind of reignites the whole thing, you know? There really is a collective understanding of how fortunate we are to still be playing music with the same group of people. And it makes being in a band a joy. Because really, you know, this music, that's the only thing that's going to last. And now, David Letterman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, thank you. I, that's very kind of you. I don't, um, I can't uh, begin to tell you uh, what an honor and a, a privilege is it is for me to be out of the house, honest to God. I know um, Neil Young was supposed to be here. And people are saying to me, like I had something to do with it, why isn't Neil Young here? And the truth of it is, the poor guy just can't stay up this late. That's what I heard. It was either that or he swallowed a harmonica. I'm not sure. And when I came here to rehearsal this afternoon and heard live music again, I was reminded, oh my God, what a gift live music is. I know all of these people, and, and my band and Paul Schaefer were tremendous. N never take the opportunity for live music for granted. Uh, that's the message I could bring to you folks tonight. It's a delight to be back here for this. In 1991, things in the world of musical culture changed with an album entitled 10. And 
It was like a Chinook coming out of the Pacific Northwest. And it, it, was, it had anger to it, and it appealed to 20-something people who felt displaced and, and unemployed and left out. And I was almost 50, and even I was pissed off. And then it turned out that these guys in Pearl Jam were, were something more than a band. They were... a true living cultural organism. They, they would recognize injustice and they would stand up and react. In 1994, these gentlemen risked their careers by going after those beady-eyed, bloodthirsty weasels at Ticketmaster. Those blood-sucking, beady-eyed weasels. I'm just, uh, I'm just enjoying saying that. And because they did, because they stood up to the corporation, I'm happy to say, ladies and gentlemen, today, every concert ticket in the United States of America is free. As I've got to know these uh, gentlemen, they're very generous of spirit. As a matter of fact, listen to this. Tonight, the entire balcony is full of former Pearl Jam drummers. Stand up. Come on, boys. There they are. I want to, uh, I want to say a, a couple of things about the, the music of this uh, group. And uh, the nice thing about knowing them for as long as I've known them, uh, I know them as friends as, as well as uh, cultural icons. There was a period in my life when I couldn't stop doing this do 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 Great, now we owe them a lot of money. One night on the show, I'm doing it, and the stage door bursts open, in walks Eddie Vedder. He sings the song with Paul and the band, then he comes over to me and he looks me right in the eye and he says, stop doing that. <laughs> and I was cured, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you a, um, a story that I'm very fond of, um, and it, it's uh, about a, a, a friendship with a guy who has done something for me that I'll remember my entire life. When I had three shows left to go uh, on a run, and um, Eddie Vedder was on that show, and he uh, sang Better Man. And I, I like to tell myself it's because it rhymed with Letterman. But <laughs> at, at the end of the show, Eddie Vedder came up to me, and he, he handed me this. And it, I don't know if you can see that, but that's the name of my son. And he gave me this letter, and he said, this letter is for your son. I want you to give it to Harry. I think we have a picture of my son, Harry. Is he? There he is. He, uh, oh, no, 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 that, that's the worst. Forget, for, forget that. It's, uh, we, we've, we've had him to all the best clinics. We've taken a gap year in middle school. I don't know. So, uh, 
if, if you're in show business, uh, likely there's a good, strong streak of cynicism in you, and I would be the president of that club, except for things like this. This letter to my son from Eddie Vedder, May 18th, 2015. Three shows left for me. I'll read you this letter now, if you don't mind. This is Eddie talking to my son. Hi, Harry. My name is Eddie Vetter, and I'm a friend of your dad's. I wanted you to have this small guitar to start with. Try it out, make a little noise, I'll make you a deal. If you learn even one song on this guitar, I'll get you a nicer, bigger one for your birthday, maybe an electric one. You let me know. And my son loves to fish. Eddie adds here, playing guitar is kind of like fishing, fishing for songs. Good luck, Harry, in all things. Yours truly, Ed. There's, there's quite a few reasons why these people uh, are in the Hall of Fame, but forgive me if this personally is the most important reason they're in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my extreme pleasure and honor to induct into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the legendary Pearl Jam. Thank you. Maybe the most important reason we came here tonight is not to receive this honor, uh, but to honor those who have worked so hard for this band to help it function, to help it grow, to help it flourish. Sometimes only inching forward. To all these people, we give our most sincere and deepest thanks. Your hard work and love and dedication means that this award is as much for you as it is for us. You make us feel like we're one big happy family. We want to thank our fans and our fan club. Whose belief in us carried us through the times where we didn't believe, or we lost hope, or we lost the plot, or we lost each other. Thank you so much to the greater Pearl Jam community whose fierce autonomy and evolving manifestation is still a source of amazement and wonder to us all. Keep doing what you're doing. We're having so much fun watching you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame for including me with this amazing band. And Pro Jam saved my life. And to the Jamily, and to my family, my kids, I love you guys. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, I would like to thank my brothers in Pearl Jam for inviting me into their incredible family, their incredible band in 1998. Uh, my brothers in Soundgarden for inviting me into their band in 1986. We, we so appreciate the fans and the, the life's blood that you give to our art form, rock and roll. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whew. That feels good. Um, there are pivotal moments in life that change you forever. I've had many of these. But the first was in 1976. I was a Boy Scout one day, 11 years old, when my friends Danny and Rick told me about the rock band Kiss. I asked my parents for a guitar that night. I want to thank my mom, Louise McCready, for her love and support for teaching me about Warhol and the Rolling Stones and dyeing my hair. My dad, Roy McCready, thank you for giving me the love and guidance and teaching me to train my mind, body, and spirit. Pearl Jam, you're my brothers. I love you. I love you guys. I love your families. My dear friend Duff McKagan told me one time, you guys did it right. 
but we're only as good as the people that are around us. Our manager, Kelly Curtis, Michelle Anthony, Michael Goldstone, Nicole Vandenberg, George Webb, Donnie Spada, Chris Adams, Brendan O'Brien, and our fan club, our road crew, and every person that holds us up so we can do what we love. Oh, and finally, to my amazing wife, Ashley, who keeps my world together, I love you. All right, thank you. In, in 1983, I moved to Seattle looking for my tribe. I, I met Stone uh, within a month of moving to Seattle. At those first Seattle punk rock shows I went to almost 35 years ago, which ultimately led me to our band and our community. Being here with the band, who have become some of my best friends in the process, making music and art, traveling the world, supporting causes and programs together, making small differences, meeting great artists and creative minds all over the world. That's a pretty great fucking life. Thanks. It, it's an honor and mind-boggling to be a part of a club that includes so many of our heroes. Neil, The Class, Zeppelin, The Stooges, Cheap Trick. But the fact is that we were affected and infected by bands that aren't here. So many important bands that made us want to pick up our guitars and write songs. Roxy Music, The Jam, Devo, X, Black Flag. Dead Kennedys, Jane's Addiction, so many others, all worthy. But the very best part about tonight is that my mom, who gave me the keys to the piano and the arts, and my dad, who taught me about hard work and community, they're here with my family. So this is for every small town kid who has a dream. Thanks to everybody who supports us and inspires us, our great friends, everybody who works with us, with the band, but especially Pandora, who puts up with my consistent inconsistency every day. Thank you. I love, love you. All right. Very kind, thank you so much. Um, so, climate change is real. That is not fake news. And here we are in, in our modern technology, advanced technology age, and we've got a lot of evolving to do. We, it's evolution, baby. So, lucky and grateful are two things I am every day. And uh, I'm just grateful to be alive. And, uh, and I also, I wanna publicly ap apologize, you know, all the, uh, you know, making our bandmates, making my bandmates suffer with a singer who was climbing on the rafters and hanging off of pipes and jumping off of balconies and... <laughs> they really didn't deserve that. And, um, but it was, it was also the power of music. I, I swear, I, I used to be able to like hold my whole body up with one finger. And, but if, you, if the music wasn't playing, I couldn't do it with both hands. It's the power of rock and roll. One illustration. Uh, when, I th when I think about high altitudes, I th think about my wife, Jill. You know, a kite does not rise into the air unless someone is holding the string. It's so important, you know, especially if that, if that kite gets way high in the air, you really have to trust the person holding the line. And that person has to be loyal and believe in you and then have the strength to reel you back. And so to my wife, Jill, I, I, I thank you. And I am looking forward to all our future days on the ground together. And, and I'm glad I get to hold the cord for you when you get to soar as you do. My two daughters, Olivia and Harper. Um, I try to teach them everything I know and then 
they teach me the rest. Uh, and and if, if somehow, some way, Chance the Rapper ever sees or hears this, I, I just want to tell him my daughter, Olivia, loves you. And we, <laughs> you have our highest approval. And I also, Chance, want to thank you for all the great work you're doing in Chicago. That's the kind of music activism <laughs> that gives us all hope. So these three girls, I just can't tell you. I just love them more than anything. And that's a lot because it says a lot because I really love The Who. <laughs> and the Ramones and the band and Fugazi and Iggy Pop and Slater Kinney and the Guided by Voices and the, the list goes on because I've listened to music every day of my life for my whole life. And uh, you know how lucky I was to meet Jack Irons. He's here tonight. Without me and him, none of this happens because I don't meet Jeff and Stone. I'm not in this building. I'm probably not even on the planet. I'm certainly not in the spot that I'm standing in now. Jack, thanks so much, and uh, thanks for your friendship. And, and you're a great drummer for our group. Somehow, um, somehow we were so fortunate that, you know, we, we had a few drummers. But Matt Cameron has really been the one that really kept us alive for this last 15, 16, 17 years. At a time when we didn't know if, we weren't sure what was gonna happen and he enabled us not just to survive but to thrive. And um, we had the great Dave Abruzis. He was a great drummer. He is a great drummer. He's a great fucking drummer. Matt Chamberlain, Jack, and, uh, and now, Dave Cruzen, who we got to play with this week for the first time in 25 years. And speaking of Dave's, I really want to thank Dave Letterman for uh, being part of our honor tonight. So lastly, we've been through a lot, this group, and, and uh, if it weren't for everybody out there who cared about our music, if it weren't for everybody out there who, who came to the shows and brought their energy. Those were the things that really kept us together and we felt a responsibility to the music that was bigger than ourselves. We knew that we were better together than apart. And it was you that, that galvanized us and forged a brotherhood and a family. I love these people so much. And we love hanging out, and we love touring, we love playing, we love writing, we love recording. And I feel like maybe we're about halfway there to deserve something of this, this uh, uh, an accolade of this kind of stature, maybe halfway there. But this, this is very encouraging, and um, we're, we're very grateful, and thank you very, very much.
Thank you. It's real. Could have turned into dim, but he tuned out. A bad time, nothing could save him.
locks on the chains that he swore everywhere. Oh, but first he was stripped, then he was stabbed by a faceless man. Yeah, fuckers! On the keyboard, uh, he's played every show with us for the last 17 years. He's our uh, Hawaiian mana. So uh, let me thank him and uh, introduce you, everybody. Mr. Boom Gasper on the keys, the B3. Thank you. 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hall of Fame. I think we're going to do one more. We're going to get a few more people out here. This one's Barack O'Neill.